So the role of a transplant surgeon, just a, an overview, really um, lung transplantation has evolved quite a bit over the last 10 years. And in particular, uh, we've helped to increase the conversion rate because of a number of surgical initiatives. Um, as a thoracic surgeon, you're looking at lungs every day, you're explanting lungs every day. And it's sometimes it's almost intuitive understanding the difference between a good lung, a lung that functions very well, and an extended or marginal lung that will function very well. And a lung that has, unfortunately, some characteristics that you think either short-term or long-term that patient is going to run into trouble. So a surgeon in, at a consulting level that's been exposed to many patients, looking at many lungs, it's used for them to go on a retrieval, to understand the donor process, and to go through the process with MCHGs so that they can understand what a compliant lung is. And a lot of it is macroscopic inspection and, and, and taking it from there. Ex vivo lung perfusion I'll talk about uh, soon enough, but this has come through, I suppose, since 2005, 2006, it was pioneered by a chap called Stig in, in Sweden, who was seen as this uh, thoracic surgeon, lung transplant surgeon, but a mad scientist. And he developed the concept of ex vivo lung perfusion so that we could assess and potentially recondition lungs prior to implantation. It was then taken forward by Shaf Kashafji in Toronto, and I was a fellow with him in 2000, 2007, 2008, and I'll have a chat about uh, Shaf's uh, pioneering work since then. Non-heart beating donation, which is donation after cardiac terminal death where you withdraw care and you wait till the patient is, is asystolic, a patient that you can't declare brainstem death on and you bring it to theatre and you harvest the organs, is something that has really taken off in most parts of the world, but as of yet, I suppose we've done a handful of what would be referred to as NHBD or DCD donors in Ireland. And even though we have gone from three lungs when I started in 2011 and we'll probably get to nearly 40 lungs this year, you know, either between um, improving the conversion rate, uh, DCD donors, and potentially taking work from Northern Ireland, I really see this unit doing at least 60 lungs a year, if not more. Um, lower uh, graft reductions uh, helps us to improve the conversion rate, so very large donors that don't have a suitable size recipient will get implanted. And then we have a role to play, although I have to say the ICU people are absolutely fantastic here, uh, led by Ed Carton and Colonel Lachlan, and ECMO serves as a bridge to transplantation. So today I'm just going to talk for a few minutes around ex vivo, and we've done our first ex vivo lung perfusion case here. And it was a 20-year-old female with cystic fibrosis who was on long-term oxygen therapy and on non-invasive ventilation at night. And she'd had six hospital admissions in the pre previous 18 months. So she's constantly in, in, in care. And when you, when you talked to her, you could see that she was slowly becoming more and more cachectic because with all the infections, despite peg feeding, you know, trying to improve her nut nutritional status, she was losing weight. And her BMI was really down to about 18 at this stage. And you know, we only list people between a BMI of 18 and 28. So she was near to either getting delisted or having a septic episode that she would not recover from. We are the highest uh, CF uh, transplant unit in Europe. I do think at some stage, you know, the CFs are always online, but you might even find people from outside Ireland will want to come to this unit to have their transplant. However, there's still a sizable number of patients with CF that are actually dying on the waiting list. And when you talk to the CF group around Ireland, that they expect the CF numbers to increase by 50% over the next five years. So despite gene therapy and you know all this stuff talk about in vitro fertilization and being able to manipulate uh, the genes, uh, the CF community is only going to increase. There's also, um, I think, five registered uh, CF units around Ireland. We're not a registered CF unit, but we're going to become one because we're actually looking after about 100 CF patients at this stage. Um, the CF Association has actually given us somebody so that we can uh, at least contribute to the registry. We don't have a database manager for lung transplant database, but we have one for a CF database. So hopefully this will um, again be seen as a good thing from Matter Hospital. So we got a, a, an offer, and this was a brainstem death offer from uh, the, a very far away from, from the peripheries of Ireland. And um, you get the call, uh, we'd already had two transplants that week. Uh, people are tired and the call comes in over the weekend with absolutely no staff around. I had one fellow who's <laughs> really junior and no other registrars to do a retrieval, nobody to necessarily help with the transplant. So the donor um, was a young donor, a non-smoker, so that always kind of gets you a little bit more awake when you get the call, um, had aspirated 
um, because of the adverse effects of brainstem death, uh, they'd gone into some form of, I suppose, cardiogenic uh, shock. Their ejection fraction was 20%. They were on very high, uh, particularly noradrenaline requirements. And there was thought to be either neurogenic because of brainstem death or cardiogenic pulmonary edema on the x-ray. And the gases were very poor. So on 100%, the, the PO2 was 11. So to put it into context, your PO2 should be over 40 at least. And to be perfectly honest, if you've got a reasonably good set of lungs, your PO2 should be in the 50s or 60s. And I was concerned a little bit about the long ischemic time as well. Um, so um, I decided that, you know, the ex vivo would be something to consider. Uh, because in this situation, I could bring the lungs back, um, done by a junior retrieval fellow. Um, I could then look at them from a surgical perspective. Um, I could put them on the circuit and if necessary, recondition them and possibly implant them. And I, I felt that there was a reasonable chance of a conversion rate here because it was a young donor and it was a non-smoker. So um, the STEAM solution, you'll see the bottle there on the left-hand side, it's actually about uh, 500 euros per bottle. So the cost of an EVLP circuit is about between 14 and 15k. And we've really struggled, you know, it's taken us three years to get any kind of funding to have one EVLP circuit in the hospital. I've tried to put into context because it's like the price of doing a pleural biopsy and I must have six or seven cases on my list today. But nevertheless, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it has high dextrin, high albumin content, so it will pull the pulmonary edema fluid out. It's got heparin. You know, you always worry, you know, either with the withdrawal of care donor or a DVD donor, that there's going to be some clot in the lung. You give steroids well in advance of, 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 um, of um, implanting them, so it helps to, reject, uh, helps to reduce primary graft dysfunction. And antibiotics as directed by either the donor or the recipient cultures. Um, there is a group in NBCD with Paul McLaughlin that are uh, looking at a different type of solution based on viscosity of blood, and they say it's, it's pennies to make. So we're I'm trying to link them in with Toronto to see, and they're going through the patent process at the moment, so that would be useful. And um, there <coughs> are groups that are interested to uh, use EVLP to manipulate lungs prior to implantation. So Jerry McAfee and I are working together around the role of alpha-1, which is a good anti-inflammatory uh, to consider for prior to implantation. Anyway, I brought, we brought the lungs back, and um, the junior fellow had decided to split the lungs prior to taking them back. And I was like, well, I don't have two EVLP machines, I've only got one. I've, um, there was some reconditioning done in situ, so we decided that I would start with the left lung implant, and I called a colleague in. So consultant colleague, you know, one child at home that he was supposed to look after who was having a party, and I uh, called him in on a Saturday morning, he very, you know, was very good and helped out and started the, the transplant. So we put the right lung on the EVLP, and over four hours you could see the gas is just in improving. Uh, the bronch was good, the uh, initial microscopy on the lavage was clear, and you could see that the lungs, they were like this to begin with, and the compliance just got better and better and better, so I was, was quite pleased about that. And so with the STEAM solution going through, it helps for controlled uh, rewarming, controlled reperfusion. We actually uh, decide on what flow goes through the lungs, what the PA pressure will be through the lungs. We did a bronch and we added in protective ventilation strategies to help reduce the limit of bar trauma that might happen with cold lungs when they're being rewarmed. Uh, and the gases were 59 and 100% at the end. So this is the lung on the EVLP circuit, and uh, just so that you can see here, this is the uh, it connecting into the um, airway. This is where you can do the bronch and take the vases. This is the pulmonary artery coming in. There's a shunt here that goes back into an automated circuit that has a pump and a filter and everything else. And uh, the flow comes then out into the pulmonary artery and out through an open left atrium at the back. Um, so that just gives you the idea of, of how it works. It's actually a very, very simple process. I think the hardest part of it is um, the perfusionist actually setting up the circuit and uh, de airing the circuit and starting the circuit, and, and they've been very good and very, very much on board. And so this is the uh, double lung having gone into this lady, and I thought it was a useful learning curve because you can see the difference between the right lung and the left lung. And the left lung was not EVLP'd. You can see that it's certainly looking bigger because it's it's more fluid in it, it's heavier, and you can even see that there's a little bit of uh, reperfusion injury in the lung on that side. And the right lung that went in, you can just macroscopically see the difference, and you can see that the lung is deflating better. You can see the difference between the two, and that just kind of clarifies how EVLP works and how it can actually 
in reconditioned limbs. I was part of uh, one of the PIs of a trial in the UK. It's a developed trial. We brought the five transplant centres together and we looked to see if transplantation versus ego P transplantation, whether it was non-inferior. And we've shown that it is non-inferior. From a statistical point of view, we couldn't really do more than that. But we know that the outcomes between EVRP transplant versus transplant, there's no difference. So the post-operative x-ray shows extubated day one. And again, you can see that the injury to the left lung is more than the injury to the right lung that has been EVLP'd. And this is her on her discharge x-ray going home at day 24. So it allows manipulation of the lung for diagnostic reasons, for therapeutic reasons, without immediately um, supporting the needs of the recipient, and helps prevent uh, primary graft dysfunction that can come up can occur in about 10 to 11 percent of cases. And so with transplant activity going up, I, you know, so far this year I think we've done 33, 34 lungs, and you know we're really trying to get to 40. To be honest, we should be over 40. But we have actually had, we've had a capacity issue about getting people <coughs> in and assessed. So there have been lungs that we should have transplanted with no suitable recipient. So um, I think if we're able to deal with the resource side of things, it'll improve. Unfortunately, you're giving a good story all of the time. So we put our, our budget into the HSC to be considered, but all the money went to pancreas transplant because they've been giving out for the last 12 months. <laughs> and uh, so it's a very disappointing. Um, so you, you can only work staff so much, including surgeons and profusions and anaesthetists, and then beyond that you, you've got to say to yourself, well, you know, this is our capacity, this is as much as we can do. I think with the current staffing and current resources we can possibly get to 40, and that's pushing people. But, you know, realistically we, we, we should or could be getting to 60 or even 80 cases a year. So there are lots of reasons why you might consider EVLP. Um, you know, edema of the lungs, pus in the lungs, uh, there's left lower lobe collapse here, often happens with people with high BMI. Um, and then sometimes people will tell you things and you're not quite sure what they're talking about. For example, this lady had bullet in her lungs because she was a cannabis smoker. And um, if you think that the ischemic time is going to be more than 12 hours and you're bringing the lungs back to have a look before you make a decision, you might consider EVLP in the part implantation. Or if you're waiting on, for example, a cross match to come through um, because the people that you've brought in haven't been suitable from a cross match issue, but the donor hospital don't want to wait, they want to cross clamp and retrieve the lungs, then if the ischemic time is more than 12 hours for logistical reasons, you can consider EVLP. So the, we, we've, we've really pushed ahead without EVLP because of the funding issues to begin with, and we've, we've, we, we do take a lot of marginal lungs and we will implant them, but our results um, at one in five years is superior to those results in the UK. And you know, in this particular IPF recipient who's 63 with coronary disease, he'd never be considered in the UK. Anybody over 60 won't get considered. Whereas, or the oldest person we've transplanted to 72. So I think we've got a higher risk population and we're still doing reasonably well. So I think we're, we're making the right judgment calls when it comes to matching and, and transplanting people. And uh, you know, it's not just around EVLP of a marginal donor for a lung transplant. Uh, but I am keen to expand the DCD uh, donor pool, which is where you withdraw care and uh, you harvest the lungs, uh, and then you can consider EVLP. These lungs were marginal. It was a DCD donor. They went on the circuit, and afterwards you can see it was a young boy with CF, and he's done well. So on the long-term scale, you know, people are beginning to realise more and more that, uh, unlike heart transplant, where you'll get 20 years, lung transplant. Um, you know, the median survival is probably uh, eight or nine years for all comers. Uh, having said that, I, you know, the longest person we have following a transplant of 22 years, but there, there's a couple of, you know, things to have a, have a think about. And I do wonder whether uh, reconditioning of the lungs on the circuit will be the way forward. So I've been invited over at the European Society of Organ Transplantation because um, I'm working with Toronto around a couple of the um, EVLP e e projects. They're about to they're in the process of building a machine with the Nova Lung Company. And Shaf gave a, co uh, a couple of uh, comments which I thought was useful. He's done 220 EVLP transplants. It kind of, you know, it makes you kind of realise how people just think on such a different scale to us when you're struggling with, 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 with finances and capacity. And if you look at his graft here, you can see that the, um, the what we call is chronic lung allograft dysfunction, or what people might have previously referred to as BOS or bronchiolitis obliterans, you can see people who've had an EVLP transplant, the journey out to developing CLAD is so much further along than for people who've had a standard transplant. 
And, you know, similar to other organs, as John might mention, you know, the whole concept of how we perfuse organs prior to implantation, you know, and whether we do it for every lung, you know, we MOT every lung because actually the long term outcomes is, is better, is something that I think will, will be questioned in the future. And he's gone to the next step where he's uh, developed four organ hubs in the States. They've built 12 ICU beds. And what happens is for all the lungs that are not being used around the country, they go to these organ hubs and they are EVLP'd. And then they have a, a kind of a selection system with the next recipient in line, pending blood group high for antibodies will get the lung, they're, they're sent out. So it's, it's you know, it's, they're, they're, they're doing it in American style, <laughs> with support to the Canadians, everything is large scale. So just a little note at the end, uh, the other area that has, has, has really created some interest over the last few years is what we refer to as isolated lung perfusion for pulmonary metastases. This is more in the context of the fact that even when you do complete resection for metastases for all comers, the survival rate is still in the region of maybe 25-40%. So uh, there are quite a few groups around the world uh, who are at kind of the phase one trial level now. Um, that are using this technique to deliver high dose chemo to the lungs while mi minimizing systemic, to systemic toxicities. So you can give chemo up to maybe 40 times the dose in an isolated uh, lung setup. And you know, it obviously stays within the setup so you don't have the, the pass through the liver or the kidneys that might take the, ke the chemo drug out. And we cannulate the pulmonary artery, uh, you cannulate the pulmonary veins, you put a tie around the uh, airway to prevent any um, I suppose, um, bronchial circulation getting involved. Uh, you do, you clamp them, you give the chemo for 30 minutes, you flush it out, uh, you unclamp them, you wait for the uh, heparinization to come, the ACT to, to go back to normal, then you do your metastatectomy. And in particular, it's colorectal metastasis we're looking at. And I think in this unit, it would be great to kind of work together to maybe consider a project at some stage around colorectal work. Um, because, you know, from we, we seem to be doing everything in this hospital around colorectal metastasis and maybe from a research end of things, maybe this is something that we could work towards. Uh, and so the uh, yeah, isolated lung perfusion, I think it's kind of like isolated limb perfusion for melanoma. You gotta watch this page because I think this will be the, the next step forward from a cancer point of view. So the, the technique applies to both. Thanks very much. <coughs>